it's the CCO Club webinar number 71. The club webinars is where we take our club questions and we do research and we break them down and answer them for you. I really like the one that came in recently because we get questions about doing um, this type of procedures in the code. So this person actually put up the codes, what they thought it was, and then they showed the, the case, the procedure, and wanted to know if they were on track with the codes. And so we're going to go through the case and do a case study today, which I did not change the name on there, unfortunately. So I'm going to whip through that screen real quick. Uh, if you need CEUs, you can come to the CCO Club. It's at cco.us forward slash club. I just really enjoy doing that forward slash thing. There are CEUs in there. You can ask questions like this one that came in. There are students. There are uh, people who are looking for jobs. You know, they've just recently gotten their certifications, people who are getting um, extra certifications and as well as subject matter experts or people that are working and just need answers to the questions that they have because there is a community together in the CCO club then you get more than one point of view same answer but maybe different resources and stuff um, every thing that has to do with medical billing and coding and the surrounding ancillary credentials uh, is a great place to have a conversation in the club about. The case study that came in, I broke it down into multiple slides and want to just take it bit by bit because the, the procedure that was done is, you know, it's not that it's difficult to read, but it's important that when we look at it, we know how to abstract and what keywords will change the conversation. Um, I'm going to just change slides here real quick. Let me go down to this slide. Uh, this is the procedure that was done. The, it was a right femoral to anterior tibial bypass with cryovane, which really means nothing. Don't worry about that because that changes as, as different procedures change and what they use. They did a stent placement to the right common iliac artery plus the radiologic supervision and interpretation. Uh, placement of a catheter into the aorta, non-selective. Okay, so now I put this at the end because that's where we're going to talk about the codes. Now let's go back up to the um, the case itself and we're going to break it down. Here a few weeks ago we had requests for some more case studies and we'll do that. We, if there, It doesn't just have to be this particular type of procedure. Maybe it's um, inpatient visits. Uh, it could be uh, consultations. It could be, uh, you know, H&Ps. Uh, anything that you want help with or want to learn how to abstract, we're willing to put that out there for you. So let's start at the beginning. This is actually right after the introduction. I call it the introduction, but you'll have the patient's name and all of their uh, information as well as who the provider is, who the anesthesiologist is, and then some other nuances might say, you know, how much blood loss and so on and so forth. And then it gets into the meat of the procedure. And so they'll show the procedure uh, before and after, you know, what was intended to be done and what was actually done. And that's that list I just showed you. But I move that down to the end of the of the slide deck. Also, one of the advantages of the CCO Club is that you get the slide deck. Uh, if you're just in tune with us for the first time, then you will want to know that if you're watching us on a live stream through one of the social medias, you're going to get to see this, but you won't have access to the slide deck the transcript and any of the conversation that goes along with it or CEUs that eventually are created from it. Um, that is exclusive for the club. 
so the meat of what was done it always starts out usually procedure were performed as follows now we're not going to necessarily read this word for word i don't like doing that but um, i did divide this whole thing up into small little paragraphs as I saw it and I want to break down what you need to know out of those areas and sometimes it'll be a large area where there's just nothing in there but what I call fodder we don't really need any of that information to be able to code it properly all the time you're going to see that there is a comment about consent it's important to know that when you're looking at these op reports they're meant to be read as if you're completely reenacting enacting the scenario step by step so in other words um, i saw something one time that made me think of this just this very thing you know if you have a person that's never done this procedure or knows anything about this procedure you should be able to read it and reenact it of course you'd have to be a provider to be able to do that but think of it is how would you tell someone who had never heard of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and um so you think okay well you know you take two pieces of bread well what if they've never heard what bread was right okay so then you put a loaf of bread in front of them and it's like well how what if they don't know how to open it properly you know if they've never seen a loaf of bread in plastic with the twisty tie they may just open it up from the middle right because you didn't tell them otherwise and that's kind of the detail that we're describing in an op report we need to be able to have another provider come in and just step by step show everything that was done so again you'll see some information that's like why are they saying that is that really important yes it is so informed consent it's obtained by the patient and her husband because if this ever went to court or ever any reason that somebody would question what was done the patient didn't give consent for that procedure well the patient and their spouse gave consent it's stated that they did etc but for us as if you're coding you don't you don't really care about that that's not something that is pertinent to the information that you need to abstract so the patient's taken to the operating room and placed on the operating table again we're opening a loaf of bread the proper way, right? Uh, supine position and general anesthesia was uh, induced. Now, I do mention this because there are different types of anesthesia. And sometimes, almost always anesthesia is included in the procedure codes. However, you should note that you don't code for the anesthesia in reports like this. The anesthesia department codes for anesthesia. Is the procedure going to be different if it's done with a, an epidural versus a general anesthesia? Yeah, it would make a, a difference in the type of procedure that's being done. So I think it's important for us to know it, even if we maybe are not the anesthesia coder. Next. You need to know what is being operated on. We know the procedure that's being done, but we need to make sure that we understand what body part, especially when laterality is involved. That's extremely important. So the patient's right lower extremity is uh, what is going to be uh, the focus. Now, is it important that they prep the lower abdomen to the right lower extremity? Well, when they say prep, they're, they're you know, making it an antiseptic or a sterile situation as much as possible. So the fact that they go all the way up to the lower abdomen down, you know, the right lower extremity, then that, that's pertinent because that, uh, with procedures, access spots are important. But again, you know, keep in mind there's laterality and what location, right lower extremity, laterality, and the location, lower extremity, and probably the lower abdomen is going to be involved. I noticed that if laterality now, when the surgeon comes in to see you before a procedure, they actually sign or initial what other body part they're going to be doing the procedure on. 
pretty important now. It's a simple way to, to not operate on the wrong leg or the wrong arm. <laughs> Continuing, now we're getting into what's done. They're going to use a number 10 scalpel blade. That is not pertinent to us. Uh, the incision type, not pertinent. However, where they make their incision and what they're going down to for the incision could be important. Right common femoral artery. So they made an incision to the femoral artery going straight down. Important. Now, again, location. What are they working on? The femoral artery. Well, I found this graphic so that you can see where the femoral artery is. Note, that's the pelvis, the top of the femur, and that's the hip joint. And the femoral artery is that large artery that goes down and separates. So we have the aorta that breaks down and goes into the femoral arteries. We're going to be looking at some other arteries here, which will be um, important but right now femoral artery that's where they're cutting down right up here they do the incision we don't really care about the subcutaneous tissue that they use electrocartery and and that they get through the fascia that's just layers that they're going through the femoral artery sheath that's the protectin uh, that's the tissue that protects the the artery itself again not really important. Uh, ligaments for this particular procedure is not important because we're not, this is not an orthopedic procedure. So those uh, tendons and ligaments are just mostly uh, location. They're going to the, to the uh, femoral bifurcation. That's actually, see where this, this right here happens? This is the femoral bifurcation. See how that goes one, two, three. Um, or, or two, and then the patient had had a stent. That's pertinent. Think about that. They've had this procedure before. Now, are they going to remove a stent? Because that would be something that would be coded if you remove and replace a stent. Or it also tells you, as far as ICD is concerned and the disease process, that they've had to go in and put a stent in the past. So, therefore, this patient has some vascular or um, arterial vascular disease most likely. Once they get there they notice that uh, the origin, uh, the right superficial femoral artery, so that again is going to be over here superficial femoral artery right there and then that's the deep femoral artery. Uh, was completely occluded so we have a block right there at that superficial artery. Now, when we look at the codes, when we get to the end and we're looking at them, we want to differentiate for this procedure. Are we doing an artery or a vein? Because a lot of them separate as to, you know, if you're going in and doing work on a vein or an artery. Another thing is location, the femoral artery, and not just the femoral artery, the uh, superficial femoral artery, right? That's just words that should become common with you if you're doing um, this type of uh, inner, well, you would call it uh, vascular and endovascular type surgery. I'm looking at my, my uh, Z Health book that's sitting next to me. The next paragraph, it says, an in second incision is made. And you really don't have to worry about location per se here, but it's one and a half finger breadths laterally, laterally to the tibial tuberosity. If you don't know what the tibial tuberosity is, it's actually this little point, this bulge at the bottom of your knee. And so the patella is right here. And then the tuberosity, the, the, the uh, tibia, is a, a long bone, but it's not as big as the femur, but it kind of mirrors the femur. It's like a duplicate of the femur. So you have the femur coming down and the head of the femur is kind of mirrored, just a little bit smaller uh, to the uh, head of the tibia. 
Okay, and then the fibia comes off to the side. So that's really one of those little pointy heads of the tibia. Again, doesn't really matter if you know that per se, unless you're doing procedures to the knee joint and we're not, but it's giving you uh, an idea of where that location is. So again, notice here, this is the femur, this is the uh, uh, tibial artery that comes down, and we're going to be doing work on this part of the arteries right there. Okay, so we move on. Now that they found the uh, tibial tuberosity, that bone that sticks out, they make that other incision and the space between the anterior compartment muscle was then carefully open. So they go in and they don't want to mess with any of the nerves or anything, but they want to get in there and identify which artery is the one that they need to work on. If you do not have a queasy stomach, I urge you to go out to YouTube and you can actually put in these key words and you can see images of the procedures that you're that they're doing and you can see the the vessels which is kind of interesting they're all they're not color coded like they are in our images that we get right like this uh, however it's if you know what you're looking for and looking at it kind of jumps out at you so the main key words that we're looking in this paragraph are anterior tibulus artery so let's go down here here is the tibial artery right there and that's the normal tibia artery I believe is what they said but anterior so if you don't if what's the opposite of the anterior well you might think inferior or medial or whatever but I've got another picture that's going to show you where that artery is a little bit uh, better clearer it's dissected right so that's we know we're doing work on this tibulus artery uh, they dissect it and uh, when they go in they notice that they that it is uh, measured but look it appears to be relatively healthy why is that important because they're going to bypass into there just like you do to the heart when we bypass um, uh, say a vessel you take the mammary artery and you bypass it into another part of the heart and allow blood flow we've already got a stent that's occluded in this uh, up higher here so uh, we're not getting blood to the lower extremity which is going to be a bad situation for this patient so it appears to be healthy so they're going to move forward now, a lot of this information is, again, fodder, but I'm going to note a few things that you should be aware of. You don't have to have it memorized, but it's important so that you know what is uh, supposed to, uh, that could constitute a code or a change or a complication, right? Because complication is just another code that you could be using. And we're focusing on CPT here today. Uh, I could have broke it down into ICD-10 PCS as well. Uh, and you know how much I love ICD-10, but I chose not to do that because that's not what the question was about. They wanted to make sure their CPT codes were correct. What they did when they got into the vessel that they want, they make this tunnel because again we're going to make sure it's cleaned out and we're they're actually going to uh, do an anastomosis with these vessels so let's skip down and note here that they gave the patient um, 5,000 units of intravenous heparin why would you think that they would do that well what is heparin Heparin's a blood thinner, and because they're going to clean out that vessel, thin the blood out really, really good, take another vessel and sew it into that vessel that they're looking at, and they don't want any blood clots, right? So heparin, that's that's how they do that. Notice if you've ever been in the hospital or you you know someone that's been in the hospital when you were visiting, and they check the IV and they say, I'm going to come in and flush the IV they shoot heparin into that IV. 
sometimes they put heparin in before and after you are given something uh, or they change it out. And they're just flushing that IV to make sure there's no clots that build up. So 5,000 units is a lot, but but it's, we're looking at a major vessel here. Uh, so once it's heparinized, it just means they gave the heparin, uh, they do a retrograde access again, that is self-explanatory pretty much, uh, but they're going to the right common femoral artery. So now they're down by the knee, right, below the knee, and then they're going back up to the femoral artery. And we're gonna be doing some bypass here. After they do that, don't worry about uh, wires. Uh, when you see the French dilator, uh, any type of sutures and things like that, not really pertinent because that changes sometimes with whatever the provider chooses to use, whatever device they're using. Again, there's a lot of preference in there and those will sometimes be consistent if you're doing these over and over again, but it's just not information that uh, will constitute the, the type of code that's determined most of the time. So we're going to skip through that and we're going to go to where it says advance to the right iliac system. So we're in the femoral artery and we're going to go down to the iliac system. Now, if you know the vascular, the, the arteries, how they work, you've got aorta, it splits, femoral arteries, then it goes into the iliacs, and then it goes on down, right? Um, and, and it would be a good idea to familiarize yourself with those names. They usually follow the name of bones. That's why iliac um, is the same as the iliac crest, which is the bone of the pelvis. When you look at the pelvis bone and that arch at the top is actually called the iliac crest and the iliac artery comes down. So that's, you know, that next level um, that it moves to and then it splits again. So again, if you know the bones, you'll probably know common names of the major vessels and vice versa. Now that we're in the iliac system, they're going to, um, go on down with all this great equipment. It says the infrarenal uh, abdominal aorta was cannulated. Now, that means they went into the aorta. The aorta is the largest artery in the body. It goes from the heart all the way down till it separates and goes into the femoral arteries. But if there is also renal arteries that come up off of um, above the femoral arteries that go out to the kidneys. So the aorta comes down from the heart. You have the renal, the arteries that go to the renal, um, the, the, the kidneys. And but then if you keep going down, then they go out into the femoral arteries that go into the lower extremities. So what are we doing? Infrarenal abdominal aorta was cannulated. So they put a cannula in there. After they advanced it into that infrarenal uh, artery with the special equipment, uh, they do an angiogram. And this is a picture of an angiogram. So I'm looking at this and thinking, uh, again, I, I pulled it, I put in the name, but I don't have this vascular system memorized or be able to see this on site. So I don't know how big it is and all the other things, but I, we're going to make some assumptions here. All right. What I would assume is this is your aorta. And then right here are the arteries that are going to go off to the kidneys because they are actually above your pelvis, up kind of high in your back, between your pelvis and the, the end of your rib cage, the, the lower part of your rib cage. So that's what I'm thinking. These are right there, okay? But then notice that we go and we split again. Notice this very large branch, which would be like a femoral artery, but this one's all weak and um, doesn't look healthy at all. They should look similar. Notice that the renals look kind of mirror images of each other. Not exactly, but pretty much, you know, and then you, you go down to the femoral, it should be a mirror image of each other as well. So you have one here that's really nice and large, but you have this one is just squiggly. Not good. And um, then 
you would notice that they would start breaking apart again as you would go and I I don't know how far this goes down before it starts uh, breaking into the iliac and those others. But it gives you a good idea of what possibly they would look at. That's what the angiogram shows them. Okay, we have a blockage. So now we know where the blockage is. We need to get above it so that we can put a stent or do whatever we need to do to open that vessel up and then that should kind of blow up like a balloon and look like the other side. So an angiogram's done. Garmin says, so they went in by the tibia and up to the abdominal artery. Um, no, they went, the uh, correction. What they did is they went into the femoral artery, okay? And um, they are looking around, but they went also Notice they made two separate openings. Then they went down there uh, below the knee and then they looked again because what they're going to do is make sure that that vessel's good. So they're going to take the top vessel and branch it into this lower vessel. So I would say, no, that isn't correct. They start at the femoral artery, look around, then they went down in the bottom and kind of uh, opened it up to make sure that that vessel was healthy, but they didn't do that same angiogram scan, okay? And they're gonna go from the top down in anastomosis. Um, Terry says, this is great. Oh, well, good, good. Now, again, this is an area that some people specialize in. Interventional radiology is huge. It's made great advances and it's saved a lot of lives, not only from working on the heart, but these lower extremities as well. So if it is something that you are interested in, we do have more education on different types of interventional radiology. There is a certification for this. And I would urge you, if this fascinates you, to think about going into it. It's, um, once you get in there, you, it, it's pretty repetitious, it makes sense, but there's lots of little nuances and steps. But once you learn it, you know, it's pretty easy going. But I would also tell you, and I always have this book with me, and um, this is not an inexpensive investment, okay? This is a true investment. But go ahead and get, uh, um, get connected with Z Health. They have amazing training. And I would say that that would be a great place to start. After, if you've already got your credential, your core credential, and you think that this is an area you would like to specialize in, you know, um, let us know. Get in contact. You can let us know through the club, and I will connect you with some other mentors, uh, or let you know how to get involved with Z Health. I uh, get their newsletter, and then they've got a paid. Uh, subscription for some additional teaching and information and then you can get their books but again they are not um, there's something you need to plan for and they come out every year just like a coding book but they specialize specifically and then they have classes courses to really fine-tune and I don't think you're going to find anybody that's better than C Health to help you prepare for an interventional radiology credential if that's what you want to go and do. You don't have to have the credential to do it. Uh, you may want to learn it, work in it in a while, and then go pick up the credential. Then your employer might pay for you to have the credential, but a little, little sidebar there. But again, you can tell as we get in here and we start looking at some of the verbiage and the terminology, you can say, oh, wait, yeah, that that could get confusing. But again, if you know the anatomy and the physiology of the body, that's going to save you a lot of time when you go to learn something like interventional radiology. And so now getting back to the angiogram. So they did the angiogram. And because they did that, they could, saw that they could uh, do a dissection of the right common iliac artery. Now, let's look. Here's the aorta, and then here's the common iliac artery, okay? And then it, these two, uh, the iliac arteries, break down into the femoral arteries, okay? Now, that being said, let's go back and read what we're finding. They dissected and measured approximately four centimeters in length. Uh, 
and was significantly flow limiting, meaning there, you know, there wasn't a lot of blood going on in there. Uh, and again, this uh, eye cast stint was developed. Now, that doesn't mean they cre they create it right there. They they are going to get ready to place a stent is is what they're doing, and that is a stent thing that they're going to deploy. And I'm going to show you a picture of something like that here in just a second. But that's that's important because they put in a stent. If they the keywords stent deployed, right now we know. Mm. We don't care that it's a 7 by 59 millimeter. If it says eye cast, that could be important because if you're not sure, go out and Google it. Just Google eye cast stint and then you'll get a picture of it and then you can think, okay, oh, I, I understand what's going on now. You need to Google anything that you don't know. Uh, let's see, to correct the area of dissection up to eight uh, atmospheres obtaining they're going to, uh, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of how to say that, a mastocyte, that's not the right. They're going to do an anastomosis, okay, however you want to, to say that. It's not plural, but uh, past tense, forward tense, I don't know. And let's see, uh, and they look and they say, okay, yeah, this is going to work because they get excellent results. So they know they're always testing everything. Can we use this vessel? Is it going to be able to be one that we can uh, make an anastomosis from here to there and link that up and get good blood flow? Once they're satisfied with the results, the catheters and wires were removed from the patient's body. So this, at, to this point, they were just looking around, right? They've identified what the depleted vessels were or the vessels that were not getting the, the blood supply that they needed. They were able to identify that, confirm it. Then they go in and they confirm uh, the plan. Okay, it looks like we can take this vessel and we can reroute it to help uh, put the blood flow. We're going to bypass and uh, allow oxygenated blood to get through to this lower extremity. We already know we're working on the right. There are times when they do it bilaterally, that they go in and work bilaterally and say this one particular artery isn't going to be sufficient, so they have to move over and pull another artery on that same extremity, but then this one, the one that they thought would be clogged or wasn't and you know there's so when you're doing multiple extremities like that too multiple uh and there's laterality involved uh, then you got to make sure that you're doing the left and the right correctly so if you don't know what you're doing and feel comfortable with it you can really trip up quickly so now we understand where we're at and we have the anatomy here we've got the aorta it goes into the common iliac and then we have the the external and the internal iliac meaning it forks again right it branches again and that's all you have to remember about um, arteries and veins. You have a main vessel and then it just forks and then it forks and forks just like a tree. Okay, now they went in and they looked at their cryopreserved vein and they noticed there was a discrepancy. That's key, discrepancy. So are they going to be able to use it or not? Hmm. Is there a complication? So if you see a word like complication or discrepancy, that should flag you that something could be going wrong. So that was on the side between the vein and the artery, and therefore they opted to actually lyse the valves. Now, when they go do that, that's different. Ultimately, what they're going to do, uh, as you know, veins have valves right? That's how we keep the blood flow moving in one direction. It's like a trap in your toilet so you don't get backwash. And arteries do not. They're elastic, okay? So when they say they're going to lyse the valve, they're going to turn a valve, uh, they're going to turn an artery into a vein. It won't have that elasticity, but it won't have that valve that's going to prevent the flow the way they want it. Okay, so uh, so they want to be able to drain in 
anatomic position to try to match the tibial artery the best as possible. So they're going to take a valve, they're going to take the vein and make it turn into an artery so that they can, it replaces it. Okay. If they don't, then the blood can't um, flow in two directions. It's not that you want artery to flow in two directions, but we don't want that valve to mess up the blood flow, especially if you get it turned around the opposite way, right? <laughs> then you're not going to be letting blood go the way you want. Um, and I don't know much about that, but some of it's just, you know, the common, common sense. Uh, let's see. Got to, oh, got it. So they are attaching what to what. Okay, I'm going to show you in just a minute. But you see, okay, Darman says, I, I got it. I saw it. All right. Because I got another picture, I think, that I put in here. We don't care that they use a, uh, I don't even know how to say it, Lamaitre, uh, valvumatone. Uh, we managed to lyse the valve. But what I did was I Googled that. And this is what I got a picture of. And, and also, I put all of this in the resource page. So uh, our CCO Club members, you'll be able to take those links and go jump out and read more about anything that I used a picture on or where I got any of the information that I'm telling you tonight. So this actually is a device that they go in and they kind of get rid of the valves in the vein. And let's see, uh, so then they get, uh, see, appropriately, and the vein was passed through the previously created tunnel. Now we have the ability, we've now got a vessel that we're going to be able to replace or bypass the vessel that wasn't working properly or that, that was clogged or whatever reason, it was all squiggly and not nice and plush and full like uh, the other side. Then let's see, it was flushed to verify that there were no kinks and twists on the vein and it was flushed easily. Probably flushed with heparin, I don't know, but it would make sense, right? The proximal end, which proximal right, what do you have to know what proximal end is, so you have medial and proximal, uh, and was then spatulated and the common femoral artery and branches were controlled proximally and distally with a vascular sling. Now, again, don't worry too much about what a vascular sling is or anything, but whenever you see that verbiage that they did something proximally and distally, so proximately means close, distal means far away. So both ends of the vessels. So if this is closest to the heart, that's proximal. Distal is farther away from the heart. They made sure that those, those ends were good. Why? Because they're going to anastomose them into another place. And this is several ways that they do that. Uh, again, you can get pictures like this all day long on YouTube and Google images and things. If you're going to use them for something, though, make sure you know that there's a lot of these are copyrighted. So you have to give attribution like we did in our resource page. Uh, make sure. But see what they're going to do? They cut that and then they're going to move that. Right. So now they've cut that piece. Notice they've cut it. They've clamped everything down to where no blood's getting through, they're going to end up sewing this closed and taking this vessel and reattach it someplace else or distally to this, this patient. This is the actual vessel itself after they cut it off from here, which I know that's kind of hard to see. I could have made it really, really big. Um, there are different ways that they do this, which I thought was fascinating. So here is one where they cut it on top. So let's say this is the artery and they uh, or vein, whatever they're working on. They cut a slice here or they cut it like this. Maybe they cut it at an angle. Maybe they cut it at an angle and lay it open. Um, you know, uh, again, there's all different ways that they do it. And each of those have a name, which I couldn't make the graphic big enough for you to see the different names. But it's important if this is going to be an area that you're going to study in, you're, you may want to familiarize yourself with these. Will it change the way you code? No, this will not. 
because different ones will use different techniques depending on what vessel they're using to make that um, anastomosis, that reattachment, that new tube, I guess is how you would, would think of it. Uh, but just the more that you can look at verbs and you uh, words and you know what they mean or have an idea of what they mean, then you're allowed to skip them because you would know, okay, that's not pertinent. I understand what they're talking about. I can skip that, not have to dwell on it and think, Ugh, is this going to be something I need to know? All right. So let's see how we moved on. How far did we get? So they did an um, uh, ar arteriotomy on the anterior aspect of the common femoral, femoral artery was made. So that's up high, right? They've, they've cut it like this. This is what they're doing. They're cutting into it and making like an ostomy, but it's an ostomy for a vessel instead. And they enlarged it with the pot scissors and all the stuff that you really don't need to know. Uh, and the proximal anastomosis was constructed where they're going to attach it. Prior to this, they did a vein graph with controlled bulldog clamp, blah, 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 and the femoral artery. So you know what vessels you're using. And they did, they flushed and back, uh, back blooded. Again, you don't need to know that. There was no evidence of a thrombus within the vessel. Again, this is fodder. Uh, if there was, there might be some complications that you would have to code for. The uh, anastomosis was completed. Okay, so they reattached it. They showed that new route. And then uh, flow was restored. Okay, from the common femoral artery into the deep femoral artery and superficial femoral arteries. That's where they bypassed. The length of the vein was then nicely measured at the site of the anterior tibial artery and the distal part of the vein was spatulated for anastomosis. So they're getting ready to um, just make sure everything fits together. We have good blood flow and notice that they're taking a vein and they're turning it into a, they're, turning it into an artery as best they can. Uh, they're redoing the plumbing. So we have a question uh, when he says, when is it appropriate to use code Z13.6 and counter for screening for cardiovascular disorders if you were checking for DVT? Uh, okay, you could do that, but you wouldn't use that for this particular procedure because it's not a screening. They're actually doing a diag uh, diagnostic. They're going to go in and fix something if that helps you, Whitney. Now we're going to start wrapping it up, okay? So they've got uh, another blade out. They have, uh, they're going to go in and cut again. And what are they cutting? They're doing the distal anastomosis. So they've connected the top and now they've got the bottom uh, constructed again whenever, this is just talking about C, uh, propylene sutures that dissolve in the body. Prior to the completion of the anastomosis, the graft, which that's that vein, right, was flushed and the anterior tibial artery was back bled just like they did before and they completed the anastomosis. Everything looked really, really good and they tell you where they connected everything in this sentence here. Then they use a Doppler. Now, I the reason I underlined that is because there are codes for Dopplers and sometimes new coders will read this and say, Doppler. I know there's a code for using a Doppler, so I get to add that, right? No, this is all included. It's inclusive. So the Doppler is just to show blood flow, okay, on the extremity. So here we've got, again, Doppler verified excellent uh, pedal pulses, dorsal pedal pulses and posterior. Pedal. So if this is the foot, this is the the tibia and fibia and the femur and they they took that those vessels and they connected them here from here to here that and then they're going to go and listen to the pedal pulses you've seen them where they take they take your foot and they you know are feeling for that pulse to make sure do we have blood flow because if we don't have blood flow if we don't have a good restored pulse then something went wrong and we got to go start 
back at the beginning and start figuring out where uh, where the problem is. So again, the reason I underlined Doppler was to tell you that's included. That is not an additional code. And then we go in, the patient's foot was pink, warm, and very well perfused. So again, blood flow, poof, we're doing great. Both anastomoses were inspected, top and bottom. Uh, and there was no evidence of bleeding uh, for either one of the two. Then again, it goes on to say that the patient was actively taking a fish, uh, uh, eff, effiant, and therefore the snow, uh, snow surgical, and that's what this is. This is like this little thing of, they call it snow, and it just kind of dissolves and seals and packs um, applied for hemostasis because, again, they just cut into the femoral artery, which if you cut into the femoral artery and you keep bleeding, um, you bleed to death very quickly, and they don't want that to happen. Both wounds were then irrigated, and everybody, and it was closed up. Okay. Visceral is outside. Monocryl, too, I think. Monocryl, I know, is outside stitches so they might get removed or they might dissolve I don't remember so now let's go back to that one slide that I showed you a little clip what are we coding the procedures that they did they did the right femoral to anterior tibial bypass again femoral way up here at the top on the right and they bypassed it all the way down to the tibial anterior tibial uh, they put a stent in the right common iliac, and then they super they did a radiological supervision and everything. That's just a modifier. Don't worry about that. Uh, and placement of a catheter into the aorta, and it was non-selective, which you know. So, what are we going to do? Let's um, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. So the first code for that aorta is 36200 is what the person that introduced this said. Introduction of catheter into aorta, 36200. Very good. That they did that. They didn't do anything else. Then let's go up to the next one. 75710. The angiography, extremity, right? Because it was the legs unilateral because they only did the right radiological supervision and interpretation yes now note in that little green box i put there it says if they worked with the arterial the arteries it was 75710 75716 or 75774 now because as a club member, you're going to have access to this slide. I would tell you, go look at those three codes and see what they say, okay, so that you understand. And the key there is they are arterial vessels. If they had done a vein, okay, bypass with a vein, it would be 75820 or 75822. Just a little side note that uh, actually it was in find a code and I knew that that would be important for you to understand. So now we're going to look at 37221, the revascularization and they did and they say endovascular open or percutaneous doesn't matter of the iliac artery. Yes, that's what they used, right? Iliac artery, unilateral because we only did the right side, initial vessel, yes, with transluminal stent placement includes angioplasty with the same vessel when performed. Again, that's what they did. Uh, the reason you're seeing this underlined and the highlight is because that's the BAT technique. So when you go look at your 37221, uh, we want you to underline initial vessel and then notice there's a semicolon and you're going to highlight everything after the semicolon because it's going to differentiate the code above it and the code below it, everything after the semicolon. Also, there was another note included in find a code and it stated, you're going to use 37220 for the initial uh, iliac artery treated and 37222 for each additional 
uh, same size ipsilateral uh, iliac artery treated with angioplasty only, which we didn't do those. Uh, use 37221, which we did, for the initial iliac artery treated and, if applicable, 37223 for each additional ipsilateral, which again just means same side, uh, iliac artery treated with stent placement included, a including angiography angioplasty, excuse me, as needed. Now, 37221 was the correct one uh, to use, but that's a little note that is in, that is probably in your code book, and I would make sure that I uh, outlined that, right? Because that's how they trip you up on questions when you're taking the exams. Then we get into actually the first, the bypass, 35666. And that's a bypass graft because that's what they came in for with other than vein, okay, femoral, anterior, tibial, posterior tibial, or perineal artery. And what did we do? We did femoral and uh, anterior tibula. And there was also a note there that stated in 35671, a popliteal tibial or perineal artery bypass graft is performed. Just so you know, if it's a popliteal tibial, means popliteal would be the um, patella. If you're going to be there and using that artery, and all of these are labeled when you look at the graphics, if you look at that, the uh, arterial vascular system in the lower extremities, they're listed. Then again, then you would use that. Code. Okay, let me just look here. Darman says, okay, so the they bypassed from the femoral artery to the tibial artery, bypassing the iliac. Yes, they put a stent in the iliac and they bypass from the femoral to the tibial. Uh, never mind, you just answered my question. Oh, okay. And then uh, what about the old catheter? They left it in. They, they didn't need it. It was, you know, uh, it was occluded. So they were bypassing it anyway. And I don't know the particulars on that. Um, sometimes they'll remove a stent and put a new stent in. That's a code. Uh, uh, however, I, I'm assuming, and again, I don't know with this particular case, uh, if they can bypass, they'll just go ahead and bypass it because they already tried something. It didn't work. So now they're bypassing. A stent is like the first resort. You're going to put a stent in and try to keep the vessel open. That didn't work, so now they bypassed, or they put another stent in someplace. So again, those are the reasons they would do those type of things. Um, I'm not well versed in that. I would have to do more research to tell you more in depth why they would do it, or I would go research my Z Health book uh, as to why, because those type of things really do fascinate me. That's the disease process. Why do you do a stent versus a bypass? When would you use a bypass and not ever thinking about a stent? You know, and why is this particular vessel a better one to use as a bypass than another one? Uh, I know more about the heart than I do about lower extremities. Just being out there for you and <laughs> saying that I just, the lower extremities is not my forte. Although I know several people that are really good with lower extremities, and Kimberly would be one up in northern Texas. And um, hopefully we can get her on an interview sometime on our CCO Live. I know that she's very well versed with um, Z Health and doing interventional radiology. So. Uh, if this is something that you really like, if this is interesting to you, again, reach out in the, uh, go ahead and reach out. We'll connect you. Uh, Kimberly is actually in the club. We might give her a heads up because, again, she works and, and let her know, hey, I've got somebody that's interested. How, you know, would you be interested in connecting them or giving them some advice as to where they would go to, to learn more? Yeah. Heart really is, I, I'm much more interested in the heart. Um, and again, this is all done uh, in the carotids too, going up to the brain. These, This is all done this, the same way. So you've got the vascular, uh, the arterial vascular system going to the brain through the carotids. You've got through um, the aortas and, and going into the heart. And then um, you have, uh, uh, you can do things like this for, 
the arms, the upper extremities, as well as the lower extremities. But really people who are having vascular issues, they have more vascular issues with the lower extremities if they're not having a heart attack. But still the lower extremities is where you see um, this done. It's, it's large um, areas of the body that are really far away from the heart. So that pumping system kind of peters out the farther away you get from. And, you know, really the brain is pretty close to the heart and the upper extremities are, but the legs, hmm, not so much. All right. Um, I, uh, Darman says, I haven't uh, looked at the CPT in a long time since I'm studying the CRC. Really, the CRC is awesome. And, and again, that I could talk all day on that, but I really am glad this question came in so that we could address it. It is an area where, uh, you know, I need more education in it. So I got to uh, pick up some stuff and I had to think, okay, wait, am I telling them right on this? You know, uh, so we can discuss it more in the club. Maybe you guys have an additional case or scenario that, that you would like to say, yeah, is this the right code areas uh, to work in? And we can work them out together. But also, if you like this kind of a case study uh, in a specific op, per se, let me know or submit one and we'll break it down the same way. Maybe we'll look at them. I, I've done a lot of these looking at it from an ICD perspective. Uh, but, you know, we need to, to do just as much with the CPT as well. Okay. Winnie says, I make it fun. Well, <laughs> my brain always thinks for ways to, uh, uh, you know, usually I think of interventional radiology as talking about a river uh, and a creek. You know, I grew up next to the the Missouri River. And so I think of that, you know, that's your major river, but we used to go canoeing in the Ozarks you know, so that would be the different, uh, you know, we go on float trips and then I think of those really big, technically they're not, well, I guess they are rivers, but they're not like the, the Missouri or the Mississippi that I'm familiar with, you know, then you're, you're getting to smaller and then you got springs and so on. So, and when they get clogged up, you, know, you get flash flooding, right? So I, I kind of associate it with that uh, or the fact that my husband was a plumber for so many years. So I think of traps, <laughs> the plumbing in your house, <laughs> whatever works to help you learn it, right? Associate it. So this is the end. This is pretty much the, the end of what all op reports will say that, yes, they did well. They tolerated the procedure well. They were stable. And, um, you know, and then they ultimately got to go home uh, because it was so short and sweet. I thought instead of a picture, we'd put a little comment in and I found this one from uh, a cartoon collection. You can go in and find it from there. It says, I could have done more, but his, but he was just so icky inside. <laughs> that was pretty cute. I like that one. And uh, again, I think we followed up with most of the questions as we were going. So here are the places that I referenced, uh, the uh, the pictures as well as some other things that if you're in the CCO club, you have access to all this slide deck. You uh, will be able to look at it as well as get the transcript of everything that we talked about. And um, and again, continue, continuing the conversation off this presentation and we'll eventually not use this as a one CEU. We tend to combine them and it'll probably be linked with other interventional radiology presentations so that you can get three or five CEUs out of it versus just one. And that um, uh, works really well with the CCO club. All right, so I think we did good. We're right on the hour. I appreciate you joining us. If you've got something you want us to talk about uh, or, or you have questions, send them you know, in the CCO club. And then um, also, uh, if you think you'd like to see it in a webinar, do so. All right. And thank you guys for joining us on YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn. We appreciate you. 
join subscribe and share absolutely share if this was beneficial to you it will probably be beneficial to somebody else and maybe you just know somebody that's wanting to get education and they want to know our teaching style so this is how we go through all the chapters in the books that we use um, we we break it down just like this in our lectures when we talk about things okay thank you ccoclub.us no, cco.us forward slash club. Bye, guys.